Good afternoon or good morning, uh, depending on where you're joining us from. Uh, thank you for joining the uh, third of a four-part webinar series ad addressing digital transformation and the data economy in the age of COVID. Our third topic is Accelerate, getting to your North Star faster. My name is Chad Rakowski. I am a co-leader of Baker Hostetler's new digital transformation and data economy team and a partner in the Philadelphia office. I assist clients in the midst of the digital transformation, uh, helping them identify and capture the intellectual property and their valuable data, algorithms, and enterprise software. Clients rely on me uh, to help identify their IP, to build internal processes for its management, navigate open source and other open innovation strategies, and to create licensing programs that enable full value realization. I also help clients to protect that value in disputes and litigation whether through enforcing the client's IP rights or fending off attacks by competitors. The other co-leaders of the team are Juwan Serrato, a partner in the San Francisco office, and Janine Anthony Bowen, a partner in our Atlanta office. We are a multidisciplinary team focused on helping clients determine where their opportunities and vulnerabilities lie and to design a plan to manage, protect, and leverage digital uh, and, and data assets. So far in our webinar series, we've introduced the concept of digital transformation and had top recruiters identify hiring trends that might augur what the post-COVID economy will look like. In our second installment, we looked at ways that companies can leverage the data economy to pivot their business model to address new challenges or realize new efficiencies. Today, we're going to look at some features common to companies that are thriving even in the COVID era. So let me introduce to you today's uh, panelists. Dr. Lawrence Wu will speak to us today and give his perspective from two points of view. First, he is the president of Nira Economic Consulting, a global firm of consulting economists who specialize in providing expert economic testimony in the areas of antitrust, intellectual property, securities and finance, regulatory economics and tax. They are managing through the crisis like many companies. Second, he is an economist who is specialized in the economics of antitrust and IP. Many people know him for his expertise in healthcare markets and his recent work in the area includes testimony for CVS in connection with its acquisition of Aetna last year. Some of the mergers he has worked on include Express Scripts acquisition of Medco, which involves pharmacy Benefit Management Services, and Zillow's acquisition of Trulia, which involves online real estate platforms. Anne O'Brien uh, focuses her practice on advising and counseling businesses facing civil antitrust, criminal cartel, or complex white collar investigations or litigation. Anne is a partner with Baker Hostetler in her Washington DC office. Uh, her insight on antitrust agency priorities, goals, and policies are a valuable asset to companies facing international and multi-agency exposure. She has substantial experience leading every aspect of domestic and international antitrust and white collar investigations and prosecutions, including litigating federal criminal jury trials. Additionally, Anne provides clients with cutting edge compliance counseling and training that can help deter or quickly detect antitrust exposure, uh, informed by what is most important by the antitrust di division and the courts. Also with us is Aaron Rabinowitz. He's a partner in uh, our Baker Hostetler's Philadelphia office, where he counsels clients on crafting cost-efficient IP portfolios that best meet their needs. Whether those needs are protecting the client's own products, monetizing IP through licensing, or enforcing that IP against competitors in courts and in alternative dispute forums. His representations involve a wide variety of technologies, including orthopedic devices, medical diagnostic uh, systems, conventional and alternative energy technologies, biotech, aerospace components, industrial chemicals, material science, nanotech, and electronic devices. Our program today will last one hour and is approved for one hour of CLE credit in California, New York, Pennsylvania, and Texas. Colorado and New Jersey credit are available via reciprocity. Credit is pending in Georgia, Ohio, and Washington state. For all other states, attorneys can, will receive a certificate of attendance 
and electronic materials so they can file directly with their CLE credentialing entities. Uh, during the course of the webinar, you will see two slides that will contain two different CLE codes. You will need to make note of those two codes and enter them into a brief CLE questionnaire immediately following the program's conclusion. If you have any questions during the presentation, you can type your questions in the bar on the right side of your screen in the questions area. We will try our best to answer them at the end of the program. If not, we'll follow up with you after the webinar to answer those questions. We have included our email addresses on uh, this slide, so please feel free to contact, contact us at any time with comments, suggestions, concerns, or questions. Uh, we will also send an email to everyone in the next day or two with a link to a video recording of this webinar and a PDF of the presentation. So uh, today we're gonna look at some companies that have risen to meet the COVID moment and look at some common characteristics that they share that might help explain their success. We'll look at how they secured their IP um, in the technologies that they adopted in a right-sized fashion, leveraged their data in responsible ways, and adopted technologies that make them nimble and able to adapt quickly. These are companies that not only took their IP seriously, but had a clarity of vision and a discipline of process that enabled clear IP ownership. We'll look at how these sophisticated companies are sharing and combining data and IP to meet the COVID uh, threat, address concerns around protecting against anti-competitive behavior, and look at how their antitrust compliance obligations may have changed. We'll discuss the dangers of accelerating too fast. And finally, using 3D printing as a case study, will emphasize the importance of adopting the right technology and lend our educated guesses as to what types of technology might be important in the post-COVID world. So first, a, a word about how we here at Baker Hostetler uh, view digital transformation. Um, we see it from three perspectives, pivot, accelerate, and exit. Uh, when you pivot, we help clients find new uses for data, IP, and technology, some they may own and some not, in response to industry disruption or other factors by providing strategic guidance on and structuring relations involving uh, intellectual assets in new markets and business segments. Essentially, we help our clients stand up business lines or divisions that they hadn't previously contemplated. We help clients accelerate in unleashing the business insights operational efficiencies and new market opportunities that their intellectual assets have enabled by providing IP, transactional, and corporate formation guidance. And we also help clients exit when necessary by taking the learnings of their data, monetizing or liquidating those data assets. This may be M&A or other exit strategies. As you can see, digital transformation is critical in the COVID and post-COVID environment, and all businesses should be thinking about this. So who is accelerating and why? Our clients who are thriving in these times generally share three common characteristics. These are companies that have their IP clearly delineated, um, have done the things with their data to make sure uh, that it can be operationalized, um, and have adopted technologies that enable agility. When we say accelerate though, we are really talking about two phenomena. In addition to the companies that are capturing the moment that were set up uh, to, to rise to the COVID challenge. There are also those companies that are accelerating to get there and may not be as careful as they need to be um, in, in rushing um, to accelerate. So we'll discuss a bit what to watch out for uh, so that you can accelerate correctly. So we'll start with a, a, a question for Lawrence Wu. What kinds of companies do you see that are well-suited to deal with the challenges posed by COVID? What did they do right with their technology and data that helped enable success. Uh, thank you, Chad. Clearly, companies with a digital footprint have an advantage right now. If you're a restaurant and already have things set up to take mobile or online orders, you're way ahead. If you're a retailer and already have a big online presence, you're way ahead. But here's the thing, having a digital platform is good, but I don't think it's enough. So what else do you need besides technology? Uh, I think of, three things. First, 
companies that can take their product and make it even more useful to customers are doing great. And uh, I'll use an example uh, of Zoom. You know, Zoom is now a household word. It provides video conferencing services for business, and that's what we knew, uh, knew it for. But it's providing an even larger function now. It's a service that people are turning to to stay connected with their friends and family. Uh, so that's, that's a new use for this technology. And second, its ability to scale. And again, Zoom is a great example, just like others like Instacart and other home delivery services. You know, on Zoom, the number of daily users jumped from 10 million to over 200 million users. That's wow. what they had in March, 200 million users per day. And this growth happened in three months. Now that is a company that knows how to scale and you can scale, you can accelerate. Uh, and the third thing I'd say is it's more than having technology. It's a strong organization, culture and financial foundation. You know, if your company had a problem before the pandemic, the pandemic exposed it. If you had cash flow problems before the pandemic, it's worse now. If you had, if you worried about making payroll before the pandemic, you know, you're not going to be able to focus on expanding your capacity or adapting your service to take advantage of the advantages of the opportunity that are presenting themselves now. So you mentioned adaptability. Why is that important? The thing about this pandemic is that it happened so suddenly and the world changed almost overnight. Companies had to adapt quickly to survive and it's adapting to changing markets as well as market demands. So Zoom, again, you know, in early April, it was saving the world by allowing people to work remotely. Uh, a week or a couple of weeks later, Zoom bombing made companies think that they had to find another video conferencing service. Yeah. But Zoom made improvements to the security within a week. You know, that's adaptability and really understanding what customers need. Okay. That's great, Lawrence. Thanks. Um, so here we have our first CLE code, folks. Uh, open COVID. The first CLE code is open COVID. Please make a note of it so you get your CLE credits. So, <clears throat> so one of the things we had mentioned was uh, was making sure you know the, these accelerating companies can do so because they know what they've owned, what they own. They've made sort of strategy decisions and and um, uh, not only using, ingesting the technology, but protecting it in a right size fashion. So, um, you know, companies that have accelerated uh, have thought through an IP strategy that coincides with practical business plans. They've allocated resources to patent strategies that balance a barrier to entry benefits, defensive positions, and potential future royalty streams that come with patents with open innovation principles that leverage the power of open source and crowdsource solutions to solve practical business problems. They've made wise decisions in knowing when to preserve some innovations as trade secrets versus seeking patent protection, particularly when protecting valuable machine learning algorithms. Uh, they have layered and overlapped their protections, paying attention to the expanding scope of copyright protection for software programs, such as we see with Oracle's uh, Java API litigation against Google. Some, some questions, Aaron, for you. Can you walk us through some of the factors you ask clients to consider when you're trying to determine whether pursuing patent protection uh, versus preserving innovations as trade secrets? Great, thank you, Chad. Yeah, there's a few, <clears throat> excuse me, when it comes to, uh, to patents versus trade secrets, we you know, generally walk through a few things on, on our roadmap. And, and one question we always ask is, uh, the technology in, in question, is that something that someone could inspect and then recreate it or sort of make their own copy? And if the answer to that is yes, um, then patent protection is probably the, the best option. Uh, so for example, if you've got a, say a no leak valve for a travel coffee mug, not that we're doing much traveling lately, uh, but if you don't patent uh, that no leak valve, anyone who could take the valve apart and, and figure out how to make their own versions of the components um, and kind of make their own copies could do that. And if you haven't patented that, that, um, that no leak valve, that other party could do that without any legal liability. So something that could be inspected and then sort of reverse engineered or recreated, um, that's something that's pretty well uh, sort of suited for, for patent protection. On the other hand, if you have an innovation that's 
uh, difficult or perhaps even impossible to reverse engineer, that's something that may be better suited as a trade secret. So one example of this, I, I suppose, is the, the process for making Thomas's English muffins. Uh, just because you can read the package and you, you know the ingredients, uh, that doesn't mean that you know how to mix them and bake them uh, to get that sort of signature texture that we're all accustomed to in, in Thomas's muffins. Uh, so again, something that's impossible to reverse engineer, probably better suited for, for trade secrets. Um, other considerations besides sort of the, the character of the technology itself is, is of course cost. Uh, patents are legal documents. They require a patent attorney to uh, work with the inventors, uh, to draft the document, and then to sort of negotiate and, and get things through the, the patent office. Um, you know, there's there's a cost with this. Uh, it, it's often worthwhile, um, but in general patents can, you know, they can be costly and that's part of the calculus. Trade secrets on the other hand, really come at, at no cost. Um, they do come with an effort and the effort that's needed is that you you must keep your trade secret secret. Uh, it's got to be kept in a safe, like the Coke formula, uh, kept in a secure online environment. Some measures have to be taken to secure that uh, their, that technology. Another consideration is that of duration, and the question is, you know, do you do you think you might need 10, 15, or 20 years of protection? Uh, things like pharmaceuticals that that are very valuable. Every day of patent protection for pharmaceutical can be worth a lot of money. Uh, if that's the case. Consider a patent if you need, think you may need protection for, uh, you know, for, for a fairly long time. Um, on the other hand, if your product will be outmoded in, in only a few years, probably a patent and the cost is, is not quite the right fit. Um, and other forms of protection might be better. So making this choice, again, we consider whether the technology could be replicated, what's the cost of protection. Um, and there's also an intangible value, I suppose, of a patent, uh, particularly for a company seeking to raise capital, startups and, and the like. A patent is sort of a symbol of value. Uh, and in some instances, uh, you know, after your company's given some thought to its mix of IP assets, uh, maybe a mix is best. A mix between patents and trade secrets uh, is the choice that optimizes your sort of your overall uh, overall balance. Great, thanks, Aaron. So we're going to talk a bit uh, later about the importance of 3D printing in the COVID uh, era in a little more detail. But can you walk us through some of the protections for 3D printing designs and considerations when a company either uses a 3DP design or decides to share uh, a 3DP design that they created. Thanks, Chad. Yes, uh, 3D printing, I, I know we saw a slide a few slides ago that mentioned technologies that enable agility. And, and I think we've seen that 3D printing is sort of the, the you know, the, the leading example of this. Um, there's a few flavors, uh, I guess you could call them a, a protection for 3D printing designs uh, and also 3D printed products. And there are some considerations uh, that come to play when it comes to the use of uh, these designs and, and also sharing them. For 3D printing design files, which are basically the sort of instruction files that's fed to the, the 3D printer, um, that protection could be in the form of copyright, which we talked about a few moments ago. Um, that copyright would cover, you know, generally the text and, and sort of the images, uh, perhaps in, in that electronic design file. For the physical product that's printed, uh, whether it's a valve or something else, um, that protection could be in the form of utility patent, uh, could also be in the form of, of a design patent. And, and these are generally used to protect the, the product's configuration um, or even the product's appearance. Um, now, in terms of, of sort of use or, or sharing of 3D printing design files or 3D printing products, a company that's seeking to share a 3D printed innovation with the public uh, can, of course, sell or license that innovation. And one thing that we've, um, we've seen is, uh, in particular with licenses, those can be limited to a field of use. So for example, a license that uh, allows the product or the design file to be used for purposes of say the automotive market, but not also for the aerospace market. And as you can imagine, um, there's a lot of interest in, in sort of licensing pro uh, sort of processes around COVID-19. And at present, there's a number of leading companies and, and sort of top level institutions that have kind of joined in what's called the open COVID pledge. Uh, and under that, Pledge, these companies and, and institutions have offered certain, not all, but some of their patented and, and also copyrighted innovations to the public uh, free of charge for use in the battle against COVID-19. But there are certain limitations on this open COVID pledge. Uh, for example, there's a field of use. Uh, there's also a, a set duration um, after which the license will expire. And you know, for these reasons, anyone who uses a technology that's covered by the open COVID pledge uh, should take care to understand the, the specifics of, of that license. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, you know, there's similar issues on the copyright side uh, of things, Aaron, with, you know, Creative Commons has uh, supported open COVID pledge and 
Creative Commons licenses are wonderful because they're a known quantity, they're easy to adopt, um, and everybody knows what they are, but there's things you need to think through, right? That they're irrevocable, um, you know, that although they're not sub-licensable, you can't revoke the ability of uh, a licensee to share. Uh, there's a, you know, a, a sharing right within uh, the Creative Commons license and that can't be revoked. So even though it's not technically sub-licensable, once uh, if somebody's been granted that license, they can share it into perpetuity. So you really need to think about, okay, you know, we need to rise to this COVID moment. Um, you know, these are used a lot for for data sets, you know, sort of sharing um, uh, treatment and test kits, data and information. But what happens, um, you know, when COVID uh, dies down a bit, right? Uh, I don't say is cured, but, you know, when we have some sort of control over it, um, what happens next? And the open COVID li patent licenses are great. They are limited in duration, um, but the Creative Commons licenses aren't. Um, so you really need to think through your business plans, your next step. How are you integrating open innovation in, in your proprietary uh, concerns and footprint? So thanks, Aaron. Thanks for that. Thanks. Uh, so we're going to talk about something um, that I see a lot, that I deal with a lot. Um, and one of the impetuses for me in helping to launch Baker Hostetler's uh, digital transformation and data economy practice team as a team was that I kept getting requests for consultations from companies that contracted uh, for software development services around what they termed to be a platform. Um, now, what's become clear to me is that there is many different definitions of the term platform as there are companies launching one. Um, you know, it's a bit like... Uh, Humpty Dumpty in uh, Alice in Wonderland. Uh, what does the word means? It means whatever my client tells me it means. Okay, um, you know, it used to have sort of a, a clear definition, but uh, now not so much. And that there's just as many notions of, of fairness and IP ownership in various aspects of these platforms, um, you know, as there are definitions. And this is what I've come to to refer to and call the, the platform problem. Um, so what typically happens is these companies have accelerated quickly. They've built multi-component uh, software solution that combines um, some sort of unique data porting techniques. You know, maybe they've optimized Hadoop in a certain way, or they've figured out how to take unstructured data in a data lake and structure it and, and package it. they are be able to transport across multiple different types of software. Um, they feed that into some sort of rules-based decision engines. Maybe it's machine learning, some kind of, of AI component. Um, you know that uh, that provides analytic or information management results and then, then that gets pushed to a portal some sort of user interface and that helps drive larger business um better business results now this pattern is the same regardless of whether we're talking about mortgages um or energy allocation or insurance risk management healthcare consultation a uh, myriad of other business use cases um, that same pattern, like, oh, I own a platform, I pulled together these multiple different components, and this is a platform, and I own it, and the vendor doesn't. Um, there's always a combination of a, of a strong belief by the, the customer, oftentimes our client, although we do the vendor side as well, but the customer that they own all are part of the platform. You combine that with a complete lack of contract provisions that support that belief, um, and then a faith that you know the, the customer and the vendor uh, our buddies, that they all get along, that there's a, uh, you know, a common understanding of what's fair and who owns what, and they'll be able to work it out regardless of what the contract actually says. Now, sometimes that understanding falls apart when the hard work of actually allocating the IP, you know, picking which modules are owned by who, uh, you know, which bits of source code should be owned by the customer versus the vendor, who needs to repurpose this, who gets the benefit of certain functionality or code, um, you know, sometimes that understanding, uh, you know, begins to fall apart when you shine a light on it. So about 30% of my work these days is in auditing clients' IP and software programs, helping clients think through what aspects are important for them to own versus ownership by the vendor, right? Not grabbing everything, but trying to, you know, be fair about it, come to some notion of yes, and either renegotiating or amending agreements or otherwise resolving disputes, sometimes through litigation. Um, the platform problem is one of the drivers of digital transformation and, you know, one risk that is facing accelerating companies that I think, think they need to, uh, to think through. 
So <clears throat> let's talk a bit about data. Information wants to be free, right? Much of uh, what has allowed digitally transformed uh, companies to thrive in these times is the business insights enabled by big data analytics. When you ask a data scientist, how much data do you need? The answer is often more, right? Um, so housing and collecting massive amounts of enterprise data is crucial, but so is getting access um, to data generated by third parties, perhaps at times, even data available from your competitors. Data pooling for use in developing testing kits uh, and vaccines has seen an uptick as enabled by initiatives like Open COVID Pledge, but these things come with risks as, uh, as well as rewards. So a couple of questions for you, Ann. Uh, when a company is considering accelerating or pivoting, how will a company's data be relevant for antitrust purposes? What questions should they be asking about data to get information needed for antitrust purposes if they are accelerating or pivoting? Yes, Chad. Well, I think the answer is a resounding yes, said by the antitrust lawyer. Um, and I recently was on a call uh, with one of our San Francisco uh, partners who just commented, you know, I never saw COVID leading to so many antitrust issues, but there's so many. And I'm, I'm you know, I'm glad you're here on the team. And so I'm glad to be on the team and to have the team that's looking at this kind of across issues, because there are a lot of antitrust issues arising, um, as we've been discussing, and Lawrence did a great job explaining what we see as, you know, many of us continue to live life in lockdown, is that companies can accelerate um, in an online environment, often because they're able to serve uh, customers directly while those customers remain in their homes. Um, and they tend to amass a lot of data um, doing so. Um, and you know, definitionally, just like you said, Chad, I mean, in the antitrust world, I feel like every conference we're talking about big data and data. What does big data mean? What I find interesting is, you know, we can think of big um, online platforms or social media um, outlets, you know, we can talk about big data from that perspective. But the really interesting issues to me that I see is that it can also mean companies that may suddenly have pivoted or grown uh, a line of business or a way of functioning in COVID that makes them data rich all of a sudden. Um, and now they're, what are they gonna do with that data? Or do they need more data to survive in the new world they live in? And companies are doing this and they're adapting um, and accelerating. And I think companies, you know, what I've seen is they're very good at taking a look in the mirror. You know, companies have mission statements um, and, but taking a, a good look forward uh, through the looking glass as they accelerate is very important. Um, what are they going to do with that data just so they don't accelerate into a brick wall as we've talked about. Um, so I can speak to helping companies accelerating, uh, helping them not to accelerate into an antitrust brick wall. Um, yeah. So uh, I don't know how, you know, just a brief overview of where the touch points are with antitrust enforcement and antitrust issues. I mean, there's basically three touch points. There's the merger context when you're being bought or sold. Um, and, and that can also mean not just a whole buying or selling of a company, you buy or you sell. It can mean acquiring some asset you need to continue uh, to move forward and accelerate or joint ventures, for instance, that could rise to thresholds that need to be reviewed by antitrust agencies, the DOJ or the FTC. Um, and maybe around the world, globally. Um, and then there's this whole category of conduct issues, as we call them in the antitrust world, either unilateral conduct issues that we see a lot of focus on data, um, either you know, in the US we call them monopolization, in Europe they tend to call them abuse of dominance, which I think is interesting mm -hmm. because big is not necessarily bad, big can be very good. The abuse part in, in the European phrase, it's you know the abuse of that, market power and what you do with it. And we see data, and I'll try to give some examples, coming into those issues. Um, then we have the collaborations piece of antitrust, which is another type of conduct, which can be both civil or criminal. And that is coming up, those issues are coming up a lot in COVID because companies are working together in all new ways, trying to get through this, trying to keep pushing forward and accelerating and solving you know, really the world's biggest problems, whether it be vaccines or getting product to market or 3D printing things that have never been 3D printed before. Um, 
so when companies are accelerating quickly, you know, they can find themselves doing business very differently. And I think it's important for antitrust purposes to think about what data they have and how they compete. Who are they competing with? And what relevant markets do they operate in? That's always the beginning of an antitrust merger or um, monopolization assessment uh, is what is their market. And, you know, what does their data mean? Uh, if they, they might be operating at multiple levels and company may see themselves as one thing, but they have data that makes them something else. And what do they do with that data? And it's complicated. And the antitrust agencies are trying to figure this out. Yeah. But, you know, if you're operating in an adjacent market, we see this a lot in ad tech, for instance, you know, what are you doing with the data that you have? I mean, there's a lot of, of issues here and tension between privacy issues as well. If you decide to block the sharing of certain user data, are you protecting privacy interests or hurting rivals? This is a very interesting case involving Facebook and the Pinkini app, uh, where they cut off data to people searching other people's friends you know, wearing bikinis. I mean, a lot of people would think that's a great, great thing, but then you have, you know, that you can't search your friend's uh, beach photos. On the other hand, that, you know, there are, there's a lawsuit over that now because there's concerns about cutting off that data. And um, so those, you know, issues become present for everyone um, when they are looked at through an antitrust lens. Um, I think, you know, our company is accelerating to be a monopolist. I always say as an antitrust prosecutor, prosecuting price fixers, I didn't necessarily see inadvertent price fixers. But I think it's very interesting that the acquisition of data might make you an inadvertent monopolist, <laughs> particularly now as we're seeing every day companies exiting the market because they can't keep up. So you know, we've talked to some clients that all of a sudden are the only ones doing what they do or providing the, the service that they do because everyone else shut down and didn't, hasn't reopened and can't reopen. Um, and so there's, you know, some of these, um, some of these kind of niche areas that a company can find themselves to be the dominant player. And then what are they doing with that data? Because they're going to view, be viewed differently if they are believed or alleged to have monopoly power um, and they need to really be thinking about all of those things. So, so what about the collaboration context, right? You know, that they, whether, you know, apart from market power, what should they be thinking about, you know, what, what, if they want to join forces with another company in open COVID pledge or something else, and what happens when they house their competitors' data, when, you know, when they're, when, um, you know, competitors are sharing data and housing data belonging to somebody else as part of that collaboration, what factors should they be ticking off? Yeah, and, and there's a lot of need for collaboration among competitors and the antitrust agencies for years have, you know, there's been co competitor collaboration guidelines out since 2000 and, you know, they were reminding people of those now more need than ever during this pandemic um, to collaborate to address challenges and antitrust law I think wants to promote that. Um, I will say, you know, it's 20 years in antitrust enforcer when I hear about the open COVID pledge, which sounds great on many levels, you know, I have to think about that when you see who signed up for that pledge, I've checked that website back multiple times. I mean, there are a number of horizontal competitors on that list taking the pledge. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, a lot of questions come to mind, like, are they, what are they talking about? There's certainly a lot they can talk about and a lot they can move things forward, a lot they can share, um, but things like pricing and output decisions really need to be made independently or you run the risk of running afoul of antitrust laws, potentially even criminal ones. If horizontal agreements um, that relate to price uh, are reached in those contexts and we do see crisis cartels forming in pa after past crisis where desperate times call for desperate measures and people may be coming together for a laudable goal, but lines are crossed. And I think that's, that becomes a, a compliance issue um, it, there is some really good news, I think. Um, I, I feel like I've been a little bit of an and downer on some of these points, but there's some good news on the collaborations front uh, coming from the antitrust agencies. And there's a lot of material to look at if you're thinking through these complex collaboration issues, like is it okay antitrust-wise to collaborate with a competitor and I need to do it today or you know, miss this opportunity or miss the opportunity to address a real need so um, on March 24th, the DOJ and the FTC released guidelines for cooperation among competitors in the COVID 
context. That was really quick. I mean, we, you know, for the agencies to get together and do that in this crisis, and as you know, having worked in that office, I'm really proud um, that they did that because it, it really reiterates this commitment to respond quickly to the moments, to these moments we're talking about. Um, and really the agencies, they not only provided guidance talking about some behavior that's unlikely to be problematic. You know, that's a little, usually enforcers like to tell you after, you know, what the problematic thing is, but they're trying to look forward and say, this is unlikely to be problematic, regular old efficiency enhancing um, economic activity. That's just the collaboration guidelines, but sharing technical know-how, they said, rather than company specific data about prices or wages or output, you know, that's usually going to be okay. Um, practice parameter, strictly like talked about in the healthcare uh, sector um, and, and joint purchasing arrangements among healthcare providers, they said, don't raise concerns. And then they did something else, which I think is really um, a, a good testament to the commitment of the agencies to understand the moments and the business needs companies are facing in this crisis. They said, if you have a collaboration and you're concerned about the antitrust implications, a collaboration you're considering, then we will provide this expedited business review and the FTC has a corollary program to review that conduct within seven days. Um, and that is lightning speed for the government. These, you know, I worked in an office that reviewed those and for many years, it would take months um, and it's not unreasonable. They would do an investigation of that potential collaboration, but they're doing them in a week. And so far they've um, done three of them. Um, two of them involve PPE um, companies that wanted to come together to uh, collaborate in different ways to bring PPE to the market, very important. And within seven days, the division cleared that and explained why they don't have a, a present intention um, to, to prosecute or that, they're, that they designate there's not antitrust concerns. Um, so very, very interesting issues. And I yeah. think that's important for companies to think about that option if, you know, if there, there are these concerns. Thanks, Anne. Thanks, Anne. Super helpful. Um, Lawrence, Anne was talking a bit about sort of the data monolith, right? Uh, you know, a company that is, you know, almost gained market power because they've got um, access to such a rich cache of data, um, can too much data be a source of market power? Chad, you know, they say that data is the new oil, <laughs> but here, here's how I think about it as an economist. At the end of the day, we want consumers to be better off. That's what competition yields, uh, more output, lower prices, more innovation, and that's what economies of scale and more data can yield more output and lower prices. But companies can and do use customer data to be more efficient and to provide customers with better information and service. And that's a good thing. That's great, Lauren. Um, thanks. And what do you see as some of the challenges facing companies uh, from, from joint development or, or other collaborations? What are some of the, you know, from an economist perspective? In general, joint ventures are challenging to start with and many don't succeed. From an economic point of view, the first thing I think about is what is the rationale for the venture in the first place and what, what does each party contribute to the venture? So, for example, consider the Nike plus iPod sport kit. Like that's a, you know, there's a shoe sensor. It fits into the, it slips into the shoe. The sensor sends data to your iPod or iPhone. Like this is a joint venture between Apple and Nike that involves patents and trademark sharing. Look, the rationale is clear. Is Apple going to start making shoes? No. Is Nike going to start making phones? No, but they can create something great together. But you have to start with that vision and each party has to know what they're contributing. Okay. Um, and can you tell us a bit about, you know, sort of carving up IP in, in mutually successful ways? Um, you know, when they collaborate in this fashion and need to assign IP one place to the other, what, what should they be thinking about? Uh, well, it is, uh, it's challenging, especially if you are, uh, if you have a joint venture or collaboration am among competitors, because you do need rivals to cooperate. And there's always the fear that you're helping your competitors to succeed or sharing your uh, your IP. So those are big challenges. Okay. Um, and then how about uh, antitrust issues from these collaborations? What, what, what kind of challenges they pose from an economist uh, perspective? Uh, right. So, you know, Anne mentioned a couple of these, uh, uh, basic concepts, you know, there's always uh, concerns about collusion, especially if a joint venture allows for 
information exchanges or that is exchange of information that should not be shared. Uh, there's always concern about reducing the rivalry between the parents of the joint venture. So that's really a concern about potential competition. Uh, so for, for example, suppose two firms create a joint venture to open up a new market. Uh, is that going to reduce the incentive of each parent to enter that new mar market on its own? If if the if they would not have entered in the first place, then the joint, joint venture would be pro-competitive. So that's what I would look at. Uh, and then uh, lastly, I'd say uh, concern about any competitive foreclosure. You know, the venture may say that it's only going to do business with its parents. So it might foreclose the parents' rivals from getting access to the joint venture's services. So that's another uh, basic theory of, of harm that could come out of these ventures. Thanks, Lawrence. Um, so we're going <clears> to <throat> change topics a bit here, and uh, we're going to talk about uh, picking the, the the right technology. You know, not all technologies are created equal. Uh, we are seeing an uptick in company valuations uh, for those companies that identify themselves as as AI. I was on a panel last week with another organization, and the, the joke was, if you you know add dot AI to your company name, you increase your valuation by 30%. That used to be the way with blockchain, right? Uh, two, three years ago, blockchain, if you called yourself a blockchain company, your valuation shot through the roof. Um, maybe not so much anymore. Um, so companies that have laid bets on technologies that enable agility, that let them pivot, and if necessary, pivot back, have an advantage. So um, Aaron, I, I, you know, you've been thinking and, and writing on this. Tell us some ways that 3D printing is coming into its own in this uh, this age of COVID. I think you're on mute, Aaron. Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, thank you, Chad. Um, I think that's right. I think 3D printing has really, um, you know, kind of gotten a lot of uh, press, uh, you know, deservedly so recently um, because of its ability to sort of adapt and, and pivot quickly to make products that are needed and, and pivot away from things that are maybe less, um, you know, less of a high priority. So I think one, uh, you know, great example of this that we've seen in, in uh, recently is the way that leading its, uh, re, excuse me, leading research institutions um, have sort of repurposed their own 3D printing capabilities, um, sometimes in the matter of only uh, a few hours, to support efforts against uh, against COVID-19. So, um, kind of more specifically, these institutions, <clears throat> excuse me, a lot of institutions will have 3D printers in their research labs, and, and this can be at the university level, um, even you know, at, at even at the high school level. Um, and these institutions that have 3D printing uh, systems in the research labs uh, weren't using them. The labs have been closed, of course, because of um, you know, COVID-related lockdowns. And so you've got all these 3D printers just kind of sitting there idle, uh, not really doing anything. And the institutions realized very quickly that even though these 3D, 3D printing assets, the printers and, and other systems were not printing parts for use in research, um, those 3D printing assets could be used to print things like face masks and, and filters and other medical equipment uh, that were urgently needed by medical professionals. I think we all saw in the news, um, you know, certainly shortages of masks, face shields, yeah. and, and those sorts of things. And in this way, uh, universities could very quickly print face masks um, and other things that were uh, quite literally taken right off, uh, right off the press, right off the printer, and taken across the street to a hospital, um, or other care facility that needed those masks. Um, and again, this is something that could be done in, in, in the matter of, of only a few hours. And, you know, again, this sort of quick pivot um, to, or you know, sort of repurposing of, of 3D printing assets really shows the value of, of 3D printing capabilities. I think, you know, this, these capabilities were appreciated somewhat, I think before, um, you know, kind of the, the COVID-19 uh, experience that we're all having, uh, but it's really pointed up the, the ability of these, these assets to, to pivot quickly to make things that are needed. Um, as, as another example, um, a company in Italy was able to 3D print valves, um, sort of disposable valves for use of, uh, in hospital ventilators when there was a shortage of those valves. And thanks to that, uh, that company, the hospital was able to put uh, patients on ventilators uh, when without those 3D printing val printed valves, the ventilators would not have been usable or, or operable. Um, and again, I think this is a pretty dramatic in, uh, illustration of the value of 3D printing and shows the way that 3D printing can uh, you know, not only pivot quickly from one product to another, but also shows how 3D printing can sort of liberate its users um, from traditional supply chains. You know, without yeah. 3D printing, that hospital 
would have had to have wait for valves to be assembled and then shipped by its usual supplier. And, and that supplier could have been at the mercy of its own supply chain. Um, so it's in some sense, it's, it's kind of the equivalent if you're a restaurant and, and you're making salad, uh, do you want to depend on suppliers to bring your vegetables to you or do you want to have a garden in your backyard? Um, and in some sense, that's what we're seeing with, uh, with 3D printing. And disrupting supply chains uh, in, the, in the midst of it, yeah. Um, so, so Lawrence, what have you seen in the marketplace in terms of the technologies that are, are useful in COVID? There's no question that COVID will accelerate the growth and adoption of digital technology. But we've long been able to shop online. COVID just made us do a lot more of it. We've had contactless payments in the form of credit cards or e-wallets for a long time. Uh, COVID just made us use more of it. Zoom and VPN and other technologies, they've been around for a long time. Now we use it every day. Schools are using it for distance learning. Doctors are doing it uh, to uh, do patient consults uh, by video. Uh, and Aaron's example is a great one. Uh, we've had the 3D printing technology for a while now, but now companies have found a new use that's going to mitigate problems in the supply chain. Uh, but, you know, I have to say, Chad, I, the tech, there's definitely a tech story, but I don't think it's entirely a tech story. Mm -hmm. Just as important is, uh, one, how quickly can customers and consumers have adopted these existing technologies for new uses. And the second thing is how consumer behavior is going to change as a result of the pandemic. I think both of those things all made that technology uh, very useful. Yeah. Um, is COVID sparing innovation? I mean, you know, is COVID being a catalyst for, for new inventions, new innovation? Uh, I think so. And it's not just a new technology, but how that technology is used. You know, I think the pandemic basically kicked open the door of opportunities and markets for all these existing technologies. Uh, again, Aaron's ex example is a great uh, is a great one. And I think that itself will create strong incentives for further innovation. And Chad, just jumping in on that, yeah. um, I would say that telehealth, which is not something we've talked about so far, but when I worked at the antitrust division for many years, there was competition advocacy letters written regarding telehealth that I'm, I'm very proud of the work uh, done there. What a catalyst. I mean, I've done two telehealth visits to the pediatrician with my children, just well visits. It was, you know, went very well. I was totally open to it, just didn't have the need to do it before. Um, that has pushed through, I think, in an interesting way, you know, in a regulatory framework, too, where there had been resistance before to some of that. It's happening now, right away, yep. so that people can do that. And I think that's exactly what Lawrence is talking about. And we're going to see that happen in other areas. And and there's and then there's attendant legal issues to all of those uh, quick uh, new markets emerging and new new services provided. I, I I think you're right, and that happens to be an excellent <laughs> segue into what we're going to talk about, which is what comes next. Um, you know, in our first panel, Allison Blair told us that a, a company's best digital transformation consultant is COVID-19. Um, so. You know, telehealth is a perfect example. I was on, a, I attended a, day, a seminar by a prominent um, software data company yesterday, and there was a, an ER doc from LA, and he talked about why haven't we been using telehealth more? It's just so much more efficient when you're dealing with, you know, 80% of the issues that practitioners have to deal with. Um, you know, there's so much less downtime, waiting rooms, all the complaints that go with visiting a doctor's office, never mind exposing people to other sick people. Um, you know, telehealth has always made sense. Um, so the po post-COVID world usher in an, an era of increased reliance on these contactless technologies, video conferencing, home deliveries, or is it gonna go the other way, right? Are we all dying to go back to the first concert we can and dive into the first mosh pit? You know, that, that erupts at the concert. It'd be my personal uh, preference. Um, you know, we're all sort of dying for this, this human contact again. Um, so question for Lawrence, what do you think will be the important technologies and business models for a post-COVID uh, world? Well, digital will be important in the post-COVID world, but I'm glad you mentioned business models because Look, it might be old fashioned to talk about good management and adaptable and flexible business models, but I think it's really important. And ultimately, I think that's going to separate winners from losers. Mm -hmm. uh, so I guess I, I, I'll, I'll think about that, about that in three ways. 
you know, first, the pandemic is changing consumer behavior, and companies that can adapt and respond to these changes will win. For example, I think schools and universities are going to have to rethink how they provide education. Mm -hmm. That pandemic forced them to do that. Yep. You know, and the schools and universities that can do that will really win. Uh, the second thing is that the pandemic totally disrupted the supply chain. Companies that have flexible supply chains and companies that can get around bottlenecks in their supply chains are going to succeed. Uh, and third, you know, I think companies that can move quickly and gain insight more quickly will do well. Uh, for example, Cushman and Wakefield, a global real estate company, you know, they knew about the crisis pretty early because they have uh, real estate across the world. Uh, in January, their Asian executives were telling management in the U.S. that COVID was coming and it was serious. And I listened to a podcast of the CEO who said he immediately sensed danger and fear of death and he took action. Mm -hmm. But that gave Cushman weeks in advance yep. to make changes that they need to make. But so, you know, that's old fashioned, that's that's a good old fashioned high tech brain power. And I'm, I still believe in that. Yeah. Um, so, so Ann, what, what kind of lasting, you know, impression are, are we going to have here? I mean, you know, are people scarred and never going to want to be near each other ever again? You know, things like planes or restaurants, you know, what kind of new antitrust compliance issues are they going to face in this, in this post COVID world? And we, oh, we might've lost Ann. I'll tell you what, we'll come back. And I really. Uh, oh, you're back. Go ahead. Oh, can you hear me? We can now. Okay. Yeah, we lost you for um, a minute. I will say that Lawrence and I really geeked it up in preparing on this uh, this point because as people who, as an antitrust lawyer and an economist that spend our lives looking at at markets, um, supply chains, you know, free markets, this is just fascinating to us. I think how companies are adapting, how people are adapting and how this will look going forward. And, you know, just on a personal human perspective, there's just a lot of interesting questions about what life will look like as the state of home orders begin to lift. You know, companies and people can do more things, but how will that look? You know, um, we've gotten used, used to, how will restaurants look? How will, you know, hair and nail salons look? How will seeing an airlines look? We've gotten used to being packed in, and I've been thinking about, I've been really used to being packed in really tight, <laughs> more and more tight the last two decades. We've seen yeah. it's got smaller on airplanes, every tourist spot I went to seemed more crowded. You know, when I go to a restaurant, you know, there, you can hear the people right next to you and their whole conversation, and we just got used to that. But are we gonna want to do that um, given the social distancing concerns um, before we have a vaccine? So, you know, what are people going to be comfortable with? And some of the things we're talking about with distancing, you know, I think to me, it screams of reduced capacity and, and how are companies and businesses, even small businesses, is going to react to that? And what does it mean for the market? Um, and people are working just so hard to get services and, and things to you and companies to stay afloat. And, you know, and all these things, it seems like people have, you know, their own little personal stories, but, you know, in my own wonderful little neighborhood here just outside DC, you know, I, I saw a local restaurant and a local uh, small market using these little robots to deliver groceries and, you know, orders to stay in business because people weren't going in. And these little yeah. robots are so cool to watch Connecticut Avenue, a super busy street in, you know, DC here, um, watching these robots cross it and they're doing it and they're making the tech work. But that local restaurant and that local market you know, where I used to come in and they'd say, oh, there's the O'Brien kid's mom. And I'd wave as I came in and I'd pay in cash, you know, but that that wasn't tracked anywhere. Now, you know, we're using digital payment. They put into the robot, you know, my address. They're tracking now every, you know, what I tend to buy on a Friday, you know, and, and those aren't companies that small businesses that did that before. And that's just a little vignette example of the many thousands of places this is happening at all scales all around the world. So you know, what are they going to do with that data? Are these companies going to, businesses going to keep doing things that they've done during COVID after? I think a lot of them, yes. People love these robots, you know, and, and having the kids think it's cool and stuff gets to you and you don't have to deal with a person. Um, so if they continue to do that, how does that change their business? Um, and I think the data piece we talked about before and, and to me advising companies on compliance um, and compliance in the antitrust world is really important because compliance means 
preventing antitrust risk from happening or addressing it quickly if it does. Um, and you have a lot more, you know, and different, different risks than a lot of businesses had. And I think they need to think hard, um, you know, about what their new and continuing risks will be and try to, while it's difficult, while austerity measures are in place to spend money, think about things like compliance going forward. Because if you're, who are you going to be in the future as a company and what services do you provide? I mean, the good news is that's what a lot of us do. And, you know, we provide that uh, advice and there are so many kind of guardrails that can be put in place to ensure, you know, that you don't have problems going forward. But it's, it's the reality of this dynamic and changing world that we're living in. Thanks, Anne. And uh, Aaron, what are the plays, the IP plays that clients need to be making now? What should they be putting into place for, for what comes out, you know, the other side of, of this of this moment of this era? Yeah, thanks, Chad. These are these are good good questions and good points. I think um, you know, certainly in terms of protecting IP as we look at the COVID world and, and hopefully the post, you know, as things will evolve in the post-COVID world. Um, I think one thing that's going to become important is, is of course, as we heard over and over today, and, and we'll keep hearing, is, is supply chain. I think companies have, have kind of, as we all have, sort of taken certain things for granted and, and sort of the ability to make whatever we wanted, assuming we could uh, devise it. Um, and I think that's that's not so much as a given anymore. Uh, so I think things like 3D printing or, um, you know, ways to sort of mitigate your, your own supply chain risk um, may now become part of the IP Kind of the IP calculus, um, you know, just because you've invented it doesn't mean that you can necessarily make it in, in a reliable, sort of consistent way. So um, I think there's going to be some some thinking about, uh, you know, again, supply chains as, as uh, you know, companies, you know, continue to innovate. That's going to be one of the, you know, one of the things, one of the checkboxes. Um, certainly 3D printing and, and things that give you the ability to pivot back and forth between what seem like unrelated products, you know, the ability to make toys at, at nine in the morning and, and ventilator valves at, at noon. Um, that's that's a reality now, and I think for companies that uh, you know are, are sort of going to embrace that, um, they'll do well to do so. And and I think to think about you know in terms of licensing, um, you know sort of access to IP, field of use licenses, um, I think will become important if you're a sort of a platform company that, for example, that deals with you know say robot delivery uh, vehicles, as, as Anne spoke of. Um, you know, what's your field of use? How are you going to sort of parcel out and, and make that IP accessible? And and I yeah. think also as as, as Anne said. Um, we may be spending more time at home or near to home with a you know emphasis on social distancing and, and disinfection. So I think you know companies would do well to consider how they might apply their expertise to that. I had just read something about a high-end uh, beverage company that was not selling much alcohol uh, to bars and restaurants. They repurposed their facilities to make medical grade uh, sanitizer, and that really leveraged the company's expertise um, into you know sort of a market that they probably hadn't considered before. So you know again, I think these things all sort of tie together and point up the, you know, the consideration of, of how strong is your supply chain and, and what's your ability to pivot and adapt um, your product line because you may be making something in a couple months that you you never made before. That's a great point, Sarah. Thanks. Um, so it's yeah, been been fun sort of trying to think through what what, what comes next and and be prepared for it and war game all this out. And um, you know, I know the collective experience of all of us, we've seen a lot of different permutations and you know, it's a part of our job. I think we all kind of enjoy, right? Is is helping our clients prepare, um, you know, think creatively and not just sort of reactively to things. Um, so, Anne, we had, we have a question for you from the audience here. Um, do you do you foresee an uptick? I know there's already been an uptick, but do you see even more of an uptick in price gouging lawsuits or prosecutions in the coming <laughs> months, you know, or years to come? Well, I have two other webinars this week on that very topic. So a very time, in fact, I held myself back from mentioning price gouging at the top of my piece is the number one thing I'm spending time on now. And as yeah. an antitrust lawyer, I find that ironic in a lot of ways because yeah. in the, my two decades at DOJ, certainly it was more when gas prices and things like that went up after hurricanes. But yes, it's every day, it's around the world. My, my webinar yesterday was with Brazil. Um, and there are lots of issues and it's a complex web of state and now for the first time, federal enforcement. So yes, lots of issues there. Thanks, Ann. Um, so thank you to our panelists for joining. Thank you all for uh, for, for listening to us and, and trying to wrap our heads and our arms around about what's going on in this uh, in this this new era, this new world, 
how we succeed um, in this new era. Um, the last CLE code is Accelerate. Um, I, ho I hope you I hope you'll join us uh, next Wednesday at the same time, 9 a.m. Uh, Pacific, uh, noon Eastern. Uh, my colleague uh, uh, Juwan Serrato is going to moderate a panel on how to navigate your exit, restructuring op options, reorg uh, strategies, and when to file for bankruptcy. We're going to talk to some companies that are getting out of some business lines and, and jumping wholeheartedly into new digital transformation business lines. I think it'll be a really, really interesting discussion. I hope you can join us. Um, uh, you know, we will be sending out the email uh, of the uh, the video of this webinar. Uh, if you have any other questions, feel free to contact um, any of us. You'll, you'll get a copy, a PDF copy of this presentation. Our email addresses will be on the uh, the second page there. And uh, thank you. Thank you for your time. Thanks for joining us. And uh, we'll hope to see you all again soon.